And welcome back to Complex Analysis from Home. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about changes of variables and substitutions. And um, in particular, I want to look at a particular um, change that we can make to a riemann stilches integral and ask, is that correct? So uh, this is a theoretical question. Let f be a continuous function and let gamma be a bounded variation path. So those conditions guarantee that this integral exists. So the question is, is this computation ever justified? So let's look at what the computation is doing. And the question is, is it correct? So you know, you don't have to take my word for it. We're, we're asking whether this is right. Uh, so the integral from a to b of f d gamma, the normal riemann stilches integral, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply by dt over dt. So notice this says d gamma, right? d gamma is part of the notation of the riemann stilches integral. It doesn't in and of itself, well, I was about to say it doesn't mean something. It does mean something, but we have not discussed what it means. So from our point of view, d gamma is merely a notational finesse that allows us to place um, the gamma into the notation for the riemann stilches integral and declare that gamma is the path with respect to which we are integrating. Basically, it, it just declares that when we get those Riemann sums, it's gamma ti minus gamma ti minus one, not something else evaluated at ti, right? So we have not, we have not ever explicitly stated the individualized meaning of the d gamma. D gamma doesn't mean something in and of itself. Uh, however, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sort of act as if we have. So I'm gonna multiply this by dt over dt. Now, um, what does that mean? I don't know, but it looks like one, so let's multiply both sides by it. Then we're going to regroup. And instead of writing d gamma times dt over dt, then uh, we're going to write d gamma dt times dt. Now, this is a um, this might look perfectly natural. And if you look at this line and you say, oh, sure, that makes sense, then you're not thinking hard enough. So what we've got here is a riemann stilches integral. And what we've done to it is we've multiplied it by this, which is basically one, but then this shift utterly changes the meaning of the riemann stilches integral. Um, gamma is now no longer really the path with respect to which we are calculating. Now the path, because this says dt, the path with respect to which we are calculating the riemann stilches integral is now the identity path, which maps ab to ab by mapping every point to itself. Um, we are no longer integrating the function f, we're no longer evaluating f at these endpoints tau i. Now, the, the integrand of this function is f times d gamma dt. Now, if we're wondering what d gamma dt means, maybe it means nothing, or maybe it actually does mean something because d gamma dt is gamma prime. So what we've done is we've changed the integrand to f of t gamma prime of t, and we've changed the path of integration from gamma to dt. Now, everything looks perfectly suggestive in the notation, right? It looks like we're just multiplying by, um, by one, and then we're just moving a denominator, and then we're just simplifying what this derivative means. Um, the, the notations here, though, they mean very different things. And so like something profound has happened to what's actually calculated. So you should look very skeptically along at, at this calculation and say, well, that's very suspicious. However, the d gamma notation and the dt notation and the whole integral notation is designed to sort of trick us into making the right mistakes in the sense that if we do things like this, it's supposed to work. The notation is designed to support these kinds of things. And so the notation is not completely arbitrary here and it, it, it may make sense. So the question is, is it correct or is it incorrect? When is it correct? So, um, that's the theorem that we want to get to. So we're going to let these hypotheses be true again. So let f map from a, b uh, to c, and let that be continuous. And we're going to let gamma from a, b to c. But we can't just say that gamma is bounded variation. Um, that will never support this theorem. Because notice, gamma prime appears here in the conclusion. And for gamma prime to appear in the conclusion, then gamma needs to be differentiable because otherwise gamma prime is undefined. So uh, that's a stronger condition than bounded variation. And so um, we, need to, we need to furthermore say that. Um, not only do we need gamma to be differentiable, but gamma prime joins the f in being the integrand. And so it's natural to expect that the integrand should remain continuous. And if gamma prime is not continuous, then the integrand will fail its continuity. And so it's natural here 
to expect that gamma not only needs to be differentiable, but in order to pre preserve the continuity of this integrand, um, gamma prime needs to be continuously differentiable. So let's let gamma be, sorry, I misspoke. Gamma needs to be continuously differentiable. Gamma prime needs to be, differ needs to be continuous. So let gamma be uh, continuously differentiable. Um, this is also called smooth, but I don't really see the point in introducing a new term for that. So uh, let gamma be continuously differentiable. Um, and then, um, well, here's the theorem. Then the integral of f d gamma is actually equal to the integral from a to b of f of t gamma prime of t dt. So surprisingly, it actually does work. Notice that I've skipped over all the intermediate computation, which is supports, which is like pretending to be a proof of this fact. The reason I've skipped over that is because it's either unnecessary or it's nonsense. Like I can't like justify what this really means in this integral, and this is just redundant with this. So I'm skipping over the stuff that makes me worry about what dt really means and makes me worry about what d gamma really means. And I'm focusing on the stuff that I know what it makes. I know what it means. This is a normal riemann stelzius integral. And so is this, except it has a different path. Now it has the identity path from A to B and a different integrand. Now it has the integrand f of t times gamma prime of t. So, um, so both of these things are well-defined at this point. So this is the theorem that we're going to prove. How are we going to do it? We're going to use um, the same theorem that we used to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. We're going to use this continuous, uh, sorry, this uniform uh, approximation of difference quotients by derivatives theorem. Uh, and we're going to peel apart uh, what this does. Now, first of all, I want to point out that these, these integrals are actually our, our hypotheses are strong enough to guarantee that the integrals actually exist. So let's get into the proof here. Um, so uh, first of all, both integrals exist. Um, we have theorems guaranteeing that an integral exists. They depend on the path being bounded variation and the integrand function being continuous. And those conditions are met here. If gamma is continuously differentiable on uh, the interval a, b, then gamma prime exists, and gamma prime is continuous. And if it's continuous, then it's bounded. And so, um, so we use the fact that the variation of gamma, remember this theorem, the variation of gamma is the integral of gamma prime of t modulus dt. This is a bounded function. Um, so, so this integral exists because this is a continuous function. And so the variation is going to be finite. And so that shows that um, if gamma is continuously differentiable, then it has bounded variation. Now, uh, f is assumed continuous. And so this integral exists because this is bounded variation, this continuous. What about this one? Well, uh, this, is, this dt means that we're working with the identity path from ab to ab. That clearly has bounded variation. The variation is b minus a. All of the sums in the calculation of the variation, they all telescope and give you b minus a. Um, so that's no problem. That's bounded variation. What about this? Well, I've got a continuous function f, which is assumed continuous. And I've got gamma prime, which is assumed continuous. So their product is continuous. So I've got a continuous integrand. So both integrals exist. Um, that means that in order to prove that they are equal, what I can do is I can take a partition estimate to the left integral and a, the same partition estimate to the right integral and prove that those partition estimates are within epsilon of each other um, for any epsilon. So um, we'll claim, um, so actually, let me not claim that directly, but just calculate it. So um, let's let epsilon be greater than 0. And let's let p be a partition um, of the interval a, b. And later, we'll have to have conditions that p has norm less than delta or something. Um, so what we want to do here is we want to calculate the partition estimate to this, the partition estimate to this, and the difference between them in particular. So let's do that up here. And I'm going um, to shorten this, have gamma prime continuous so that I get a little extra room. And so. Let's move here, and we're going to compare the partition estimates here. So then, so I'm going to compare the sum i equals 1 to m of f of tau i 
times gamma ti minus gamma ti minus 1. I'm going to compare that partition estimate to this integral to the, the appropriate partition estimate for this integral using also the partition p, which will be uh, the sum i equals 1 to m of, now here the, the integrand is f of t gamma prime of t, not f. And so um, the thing that needs to be evaluated at tau i is that whole function f of t gamma prime of t. So here I'm going to get f of tau i, and then I'm going to get gamma prime of tau i. That's the integrand sampled at tau. And then I need the path evaluated at ti. Now the path in this case is the identity path. And so um, I get ti minus ti minus 1. So there are no gammas here because the path of interest is actually the identity path from AB to AB. Um, so the identity function on the interval AB. So that's why we don't have gammas here. And that's why we're sampling at, at gamma prime at tau here. So this thing is supposed to be small. I want that less than epsilon for partitions um, suitably fine. So we need to calculate and estimate that thing. So obviously this is a sum. This is a sum. We're going to join the sums. Let's do that. So uh, this is equal to the absolute sum, um, and that's going to be f of tau i gamma of ti minus gamma of t i minus 1 uh, minus f of tau i gamma prime of tau i ti minus ti minus 1. OK, so there are a lot of things to do here. Notice the f of tau i is constant here. We're going to factor that out. Um, but we're also going to, let's see here. Uh, we're going to factor out the f of tau i. Let's do it in one. Let's, let's, let's do it in two steps. So um, here, I'll simply factor out the f of tau i. And then we'll get this thing, gamma ti minus gamma ti minus 1 minus, and then this thing is gamma prime tau i, ti minus ti minus 1. OK. Um, yeah. So um, here, what we're going to do is what we always do in these cases. We're going to factor out a ti minus ti minus 1. And that will require dividing this term by ti minus ti minus 1. And uh, I also need to apply the triangle inequality to get these absolute values inside. But, Let's do one thing at a time. So um, this is going to give us uh, the f of tau. And then this thing will be gamma of ti minus gamma of ti minus 1 over ti minus ti minus 1 minus gamma prime tau i. So notice the difference quotient now and the derivative. And then that entire thing multiplies by ti minus ti minus 1. Now, in other arguments, I have had to be concerned about when I'm factoring this thing out and therefore dividing, having to multiply and divide by it, do I have to worry that it is potentially 0 when it's introduced in this denominator? And in this case, no, I don't. Because uh, by the definition of a partition, the ti and the ti minus 1 cannot be equal. Uh, they have to be distinct values. And so I don't need to worry about whether I have accidentally multiplied and divided by 0 in factoring out this term. OK, so that factors out the ti minus ti minus 1. And the reason I've done this is because it gives me the opportunity to recognize a difference quotient here and a derivative here. Um, now I have the end of the modulus sign that began here. Next thing we need to do is we're going to use the triangle inequality and move the modulus inside. So I'm going to move the modulus inside the sum using the triangle inequality. And then I've got a product of three things. I'm going to take the modulus of each. And I'm going to drop the modulus around this. This is necessarily a positive real number, so I'm not going to write modulus here. But I need modulus of that, and I need modulus of this here. So this is going to be less than or equal to, by the triangle inequality, the sum from i equals 1 to m of modulus f of tau i, and then modulus this thing, gamma ti minus gamma ti minus 1 over ti minus ti minus 1, and then um, gamma prime, tau i, and modulus, and then ti minus ti minus 1. So the modulus has been moved inside the sum by the triangle inequality and into the product uh, because it commutes with product. And that gives us this thing. 
I'm not writing modulus here because it's positive. Um, okay, now we need control. So what we're going to do is we're going to control. So what's our, where is our control going to come from? Just abstractly, let's talk about it first. Um, we're going to control this term. Um, this is just an arbitrary continuous function. Obviously, I can't make this term small. Um, but the function is continuous on a compact set AB. And so I do know that it's bounded. So I'm going to control this term by bounding the function by using the fact that it's continuous on a compact set. That's where we're going to get control over here. And it's only going to be control in the sense that this is bounded. Um, then this control, where are we going to get control here? Um, we're going to get control here by the uniform approximation of derivatives by difference quotients. And the control that we're going to look for is we're going to try to get this less than epsilon. But actually, epsilon is not good enough because I need to cancel something that bounds this. So epsilon over the bound. But actually, epsilon over this bound is not good enough because after I do that, I'll control all of this. But I'll still have to add up all these ti minus ti minus 1s. And I'll still effectively be calculating, well, b minus a when I sum up all those. So I'm going to contr get control epsilon over whatever bounds this over b minus a um, in order that level of control on this term in order to control this. And then hopefully, then when I add everything else, I'll get about epsilon. I need that level of control so long as the partition is delta fine. First, let's bound this term. So because f is continuous on a compact set, um, it's bounded. And so we can call that less than or equal to b for some b. So b, cap b, is just some bound. Um, and it's, it's real here, because the, the modulus here is real. So we have, um, we have a bound for f. And then by the uniform approximation of difference quotients, by the derivative, um, So what do we get? We get control over this. So um, there exists a delta greater than 0 so that um, if the partition norm is less than delta. Now, we should be careful here. The, the uniform approximation of difference quotients theorem doesn't mention partitions. But what it does mention is so long as you have this z0 and this z and this w, and they're all pretty close to each other. In, in other words, uh, w and, and z are different. And those are distinct values. And each of them has a distance to z0, which is less than delta. So all of that will be true if the partition has norm less than delta. Because if so, then the maximum difference between tau i and ti can't be farther than delta. And tau i, ti minus 1 also can't be farther than delta because this distance between those two real numbers is, is less than delta and tau i is between them. So, um, so so long as the partition norm is less than delta, then tau i, ti, and ti minus 1 will all be su sufficiently close to, um, to control this. So we have a delta so that if the partition is sufficiently fine, then this thing is less than, and we'll have to choose carefully here, this uh, gamma ti minus gamma ti minus 1 over ti minus ti minus 1 minus the derivative gamma prime tau i. This thing is less than epsilon. And as I mentioned, we have some stuff to cancel here. So um, basically, the uniform approximation theorem allows us to choose a delta to get this as small as we want. And this is exactly as small as we need it. So, um, and notice that it depends on the bound, the bound b. So that's why I had to do, I had to bound the function first. Um, so that gives us bounds for this and this, and let's put them together and um, continue this computation here. So then this is less than or equal to the summation, i equals one to m of, this thing is bounded by b. This thing is bounded by epsilon over b, b minus a. And then here, we get ti minus ti minus 1. The b's cancel, and we end up with an epsilon over b minus a out front. So that's epsilon over b minus a times, now what is this? We get a summation, i equals 1 to m, of ti minus ti minus 1. 
Well, this is just a telescoping sum of the differences between the endpoints in the partition of A, B. The sum will telescope, and uh, the, the last term, well, the first term or last term, depending on how you look at it, will end up being T sub M, which is B, and the other term at the other end will be um, T sub zero, which is, um, which is A. And so this will end up being B minus A. So that's epsilon over B minus A times B minus A, uh, which of course is epsilon. And uh, let me erase this equal or equal to because that, that one is strict. Um, I need one of these to be strict in order to get literally what I'm after here. So um, that shows that the difference between the partition estimate to this integral and the partition estimate to this integral is less than epsilon for any epsilon. So the partition can be made arbitrarily close to this, and then it is within epsilon of the same partition estimate of this. And that means that whatever the limit of these partitions is, it must agree with the limit of those partitions. And that shows that the integrals are equal. So let's just conclude here. Thus, the integrals are equal. So uh, this proves a sort of a substitution theorem um, that, I mean, this is, this is a lot like U substitution um, when we're solving integrals. And um, it's a nice theorem to have in your back pocket because it converts a riemann stilches integral into um, what is much more like an ordinary real integral. Although these are complex valued, it's a DT integral. And so, um, and so this integral is much, usually um, much easier to compute. And so uh, this, this, is, this is quite often a very useful thing to do. So what I want to do next is I want to take advantage of this theorem, and I want to illustrate how this can be useful in a computation. So we're going to do a practical integral computation by uh, taking advantage of this theorem. Now here's the example we want to consider. Now, uh, I've got f of z equals 1 over z, and gamma of t equals e to the i t, which, if you remember, is cos t plus i sine t. Now, um, just in case you think I'm pulling a fast one here, this is a riemann stilches integral. And in this case, the function f goes from a, b to c. But here, I've got a function f that maps from c to c. This is actually going to be a path integral. But remember that the path integral of f of z, so the path integral um, of, uh, on gamma of f of z dz is equal to the riemann stilches integral from a, b of f composed with gamma d gamma. And so I'm going to calculate the path integral by converting it into a Riemann-Stilches integral. And then I'm going to calculate the Riemann-Stilches integral by calculating it by, by using this theorem. So really what I'm calculating here is a path integral f of z dz. This is perhaps the most important integral to calculate in a complex analysis context. It gives you the most important surprise um, which really begins uh, the entire theory of, um, uh, of Cauchy's integral equations. Um, so let's take this very seriously. Um, so here's the example that we want to do. Uh, let's graph it first. So f of z is just 1 over z. And it's hard to graph because it's a function from the complexes to the complexes. But the first thing that you should notice about it is that it has a hole at the origin. Okay, It's undefined. Uh, when z equals 0. So here, I'm not going to try to graph f of z equals 1 over z. It's an important function. You know what it looks like on the real line, but because it's from the complexes to the complexes, it's difficult to graph. I will graph gamma of t. Um, the, uh, the, the interval a, b is from 0 to 2 pi. And we take e to the i t. That's cos t plus i sine t. The x coordinate here will be the cosine. The y coordinate will be the sine. And so what we get here is we start at the origin. Uh, sorry, we start at when when uh, the the input to gamma is is zero. That's not the origin. That's that's actually the value one uh, in the reals. Uh, that's gamma of zero is one, and then we map around the unit circle like this, and then we come back to one actually. So notice that gamma of zero is one, and gamma of two pi is likewise equal to one. And so you might expect, well, this is kind of dumb. The the both of the endpoints of the integral are the same value. And so obviously we were going to get zero. But bear with me and you know humor me, and let's do the computation. So we're going to do this computation here. And we're going to evaluate uh, this path integral as a Riemann-Stilches integral. 
and then calculate the Riemann-Stilches integral by, re by means of this recent theorem. So uh, we're going to calculate the integral f of z dz on gamma. That's the integral from 0 to 2 pi of f uh, composed with gamma d gamma, um, which is the integral from 0 to 2 pi of f composed with gamma um, evaluated at t. So now I'm using the theorem. Uh, times gamma prime of t um, here uh, dt. And this is much more like a real integral. So we're going to actually open this up and start calculating things. So what's f of gamma of t? f of gamma of t is 1 over e to the i t. Um, so this is the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 over e to the i t. Now, what's gamma prime of t? Well, um, there are several ways to go about this. But the easiest way is to use the chain rule here. We know that the derivative of e to the z is e to the z. Um, and so we have an inside function i t. Um, and so we can use the chain rule. The chain rule tells us differentiate the outside function without changing the inside function. And that'll give us back e to the i t. And then multiply by the derivative of the inside function. And the derivative of that inside function is just i, because that's a linear function on the inside, that i t. And so uh, the derivative gamma prime is i e to the i t by the chain rule. And now a miracle occurs. We have e to the i t in the bottom. We have e to the i t in the top. Um, there's nothing left. They cancel except the i. So we get i dt. Now here, um, we just have the integral of a constant. So this is i times the, the constant factors out. We get i times the integral of 1 dt. And now this is the easiest real integral you've ever done. Um, you don't need any integration theory to do that. Um, that is the area of a rectangle, literally. Um, and so whatever tricks you want to use, you want to use the fundamental theorem of calculus, go for it. You want to use the fact that it's just calculating the area of a rectangle, whatever. Uh, this gives us i times 2 pi, which we often write as 2 pi i. And so that is the answer. So the path integral along the path gamma of the function f of z is equal to 2 pi i. And now, wait a minute. I thought we were guessing that it should be 0. In fact, we had a pretty good reason to believe that it should be 0. Gamma started here. Gamma of a is here. Ended up here. Gamma of b is also here. How could we not get 0? Doesn't the fundamental theorem of calculus for the complex case tell us that we should have gotten 0? So why not 0? Um, in fact, let's remember here the integral of f of z dz along gamma is cap f of gamma of b minus cap f of gamma of a. Um, and that's provided um, cap f prime is equal to f. And Cap, a little f does actually have an antiderivative. We've learned that the logarithm has a derivative equal to 1 over z. So here, let's let f of, f, f of z be the natural log of z. So the integral of 1 over z dz along our path gamma should be the logarithm of gamma of b minus the log, well, which is 2 pi. Um, minus the logarithm of gamma of 0, which is the natural logarithm of 1, because gamma of 2 pi is 1, minus the natural logarithm of, well, gamma of 0 is also 1, uh, which is 0. So, uh-oh, now I've backed you into a corner. So something here is wrong, and it's interesting to try to figure out what. In fact, I encourage you, please pause the video and try to figure out which of these arguments is right and which of these arguments is wrong. All right, let's have a closer look and see if we can sort out why one of these arguments is right and one of them is wrong. This is the right answer here. Um, I have incorrectly used the fundamental theorem of calculus. Everything here is almost exactly right, except that the fundamental theorem of calculus requires that f prime, that cap f prime be equal to f. And it requires that that be true on 
the entire domain of integration, which is the image of gamma here. Is that true? Not almost, it's almost true. Um, what's happening here is that the logarithm itself has a jump discontinuity. So there's a point here where the logarithm has a very big oops. It goes from approximately pi i. So here, let's, let's actually, let's record this more exactly. Around here, the logarithm of z um, is the, the real logarithm of the modulus of z, but that's real logarithm of one, so that's zero, so we don't need to worry about it, plus i arg z, and arg z is approximately pi. So this is approximately i pi. It's approaching i pi. But here, the logarithm of z is the real logarithm of the modulus of z, which is the real logarithm of one, which is zero, so forget it, plus i arg z. But the argument of this point is approximately minus pi. So it's approximately minus i pi. So what happens here is that the logarithm itself has a bit of an oops. It, the logarithm has a jump discontinuity. Now, 1 over z doesn't. But the logarithm, which is what we're trying to use as the antiderivative, screws up the answer by, um, well, by, by minus 2 pi i. And so uh, it discards the, the real value. Basically, it gives us exactly the difference between these two values as the error in the calculation that the logarithm introduces by means of its jump discontinuity. So the, the, what's going on here is that um, the hypotheses of the fundamental theorem are not met because cap f, which is the logarithm, is not actually an antiderivative of little f, not right here. Everywhere else it is, but right here it gets a jump discontinuity and that messes everything up. The size of the jump discontinuity is exactly 2 pi i, and that is the error introduced by incorrectly using the logarithm in the fundamental theorem of calculus here. So the, the logarithm introduces an error of minus 2 pi i and therefore um, makes it look like the answer is 0 when in fact the answer is 2 pi i. So um, there is something going on with this circle and this function 1 over z, which is giving us a very suspicious 2 pi i. And um, if we really dig into what's going on here, um, it's kind of surprising. If you use a different circle with a different radius or a different starting point or even a square, so long as you're going once counterclockwise around this point um, at a very large radius or a small radius or even a circle that goes around it but isn't centered at the origin, you'll always tend to get 2 pi i. And that's kind of interesting. That means that um, basically something is happening at the origin which is somehow responsible for us getting a non-zero integral here. There's something about the function so that if you go around the origin with any kind of shape, um, so long as you go once counterclockwise around the origin, you'll always pick up this answer 2 pi i. If you go twice around the origin, you'll get 4 pi i. It's very suspicious. There's something going on at the origin so that when you, when you loop around that with a curve, then you'll get this 2 pi i. Um, and that's really the beginning of the story of the Cauchy integral formulas.